In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Thank you for joining us again today. We are going to continue where we left off um, with our study of uh, the first epistle of our of St. Peter. Last time we ended off in verse 13 of chapter of chapter 3. And so we'll continue. We'll continue on chapter on verse 14 of chapter 3. Um, and so we read, But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed for it is better, for it is better, uh, Sorry about that. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And so even if uh, St. Peter's hearers are, uh, if they should suffer for the sake of their righteousness and, and, you know, Christian faith and their Christian faith, it is still not something to be feared because they're blessed. And this blessing refers to the final blessedness of salvation in the age to come but it doesn't exclude um, a taste of it now. So even now, if they are reproached, if they are suffering um, because of their faith, the spirit of glory and of God will rest upon them, filling them with the blessings of, of the peace of God. And so therefore, right, they should not fear their fear. That is, um, fear the intimidating threats or uh, of the pagans. Um, they shouldn't be shaken from their composure in Christ. Instead, they should sanctify Christ as Lord in their hearts. Um, and by sanctifying Christ as Lord, what St. Peter means is that the Christian should um, have reverence towards Christ as the only true Lord um, from, from their deepest hearts, right? Um, and openly confessing Christ. Um, in the Jewish thought, the martyr sanctified the name of God by confessing it in martyrdom. And society may think that Caesar is the Lord um, and ultimately in control, but the believer, the one who's faithful, knows Christ is the one who rules over all and nothing can befall him that Christ does not allow. And so it's with this unshakable peace that a believer... Uh, can always be prepared for a defense of his faith. So to everyone who asks him for a word of explanation about the hope that's in him, he can give it and not cower uh, in fear. But he, he doesn't have to stutter over himself. He knows exactly why um, he is that faithful. And St. Peter is saying, but let that defense of his faith be representative of his daily life. How? It's with meekness and gentleness. It's always tempting to add to the defense of one's faith with this like loud, um, this loud assertion, like these, these, big, these big moments of how silly the other person's argument is of someone else's faith. No, this should be avoided, what St. Peter is saying. The defense should also be made with fear. That is with the fear of God, knowing that he hears all of our words and will uh, vindicate us in the end. So, this presupposes, of course, them having a good conscience um, and that they are indeed doing good. And if they maintain a good conduct right, in Christ and live like Christians in the thing in which they are spoken against and slandered as evildoers, those who are fighting against them will be put to shame and proven wrong. They don't have to speak up for themselves. God will, will take care of it. For you know, if they do good, and if they do the will of God, right, and what God wills, and if, he, if God wills that persecution should come on them and that they should suffer for doing good, it is still better than if they were doing evil and suffered for it. So their decision to keep a good conscience will never cause, uh, will never cause them regret, even if... Um, by you know God's uh, providence, for example, it does not result in the um, in being away from persecution. So, enduring hardships in meekness and in the fear of God, this is the best proof of the truth in the believer's preaching uh, 
And it's a very practical testimony to, to our Lord. And it is the true answer to those who ever ask him about the reason for the hope that's in them. The more, in other words, this is what made the Coptic church thrive, right? That the more that the Christians were persecuted, the more people were drawn to Christianity because of Christians enduring with joy and thanksgiving. It's a very powerful message, louder than any words that we can speak. And in verse 18, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made life in the spirit. So to kind of seal this teaching, this exhortation, to doing good in Christ, even if it leads to unjust suffering, St. Peter again, bring, he brings forward the, the example of Christ. Christ also died for sins once for all, the righteous, the, the, the righteous one, suffering unjustly for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. And in the same way, the Christians, unjust suffering is also a pathway to God. And even if they're martyred, it, it only results in a closer union with God. It's the same with Christ. When he was put to death in the flesh, he was made alive in the spirit. And the contrast here is between the realms of the flesh and the realms of the spirit. In the realm of the flesh and this visible world, Christ was put to death. But in the realm of the Spirit, by the Spirit's power, the Holy Spirit, he was made alive. And so through the Lord Jesus Christ and from our Lord Jesus Christ, one obtains inner power to accept suffering and think with thanksgiving. See, according to logic, when, when we suffer for a, for a transgression that he commits, he feels deserving of the suffering. But in the mind of our Lord Jesus Christ, the concept of divine love, it requires that we rejoice when we uh, suffer unjustly. In verse 19 and verse 20, by whom also he went and preached the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. And so it's in this state, in the days immediately following his death and his burial and his resurrection, he went and preached his victory to the spirits in prison who were once disobedient when the patience of God was waiting in the days of Noah. And so even though death seemed to be like a disastrous defeat, it actually was... Um, the pathway of triumph. And so in, in Christians, in the Christian mindset, um, Christians who are martyred will find that death for them also leads to this triumph because they, they also are made alive as Christ was. And so, you know, one contemplation here is that when St. Peter references uh, to the spirits in prison, it seems to be an allusion to the angelic uh, spirits mentioned in Genesis chapter six, around verses one through four who fell in disobedience around the time of Noah's flood. And in that passage, it says the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were, were fair, and they took wives for themselves from among them. And this passage has been uh, interpreted in different ways, but it seems that St. Peter shares this interpretation current uh, of the day, which is reflected in the works of like the book of Enoch, um, that were written like before this epistle. In this interpretation, the sons of God were the angels who lusted after earthly women and fell from their angelic state. Um, and because it was of their sin, they were imprisoned until the time of the end, awaiting for their final punishment. And so St. Peter alludes to this interpretation again in his second epistle, actually in chapter two, verse four, and St. Jude does as well in Jude chapter six. And St. Peter mentions here that Christ preached his victory to those spirits in prison because he wants to show that Christ's victory was a total and universal victory. And his triumph reaches even to the, to the, to the cosmos, even over those fallen angels now imprisoned at the farthest ends. And, you know, when uh, St. Peter mentions uh, Noah's flood, the biblical context of the disobedience of the angels allows St. Peter to refer to the time when the ark was being built because in it, only a few, right? Eight souls 
Noah, his three sons, and, and, and his wife and his, their wives were brought safely uh, through water. And this experience of salvation in the ark foreshadows Christian salvation in baptism. Salvation through the waters of the flood is a pattern and a type, and baptism is the fulfillment of this foreshadowing. Noah and his family came through the waters to inherit life in a renewed world. And the Christian also comes through the waters of baptism to inherit his new life in Christ. So for both Noah and the Christian, the life of the old sinful world has been left behind, drowned in the water, so to speak. And so St. Peter mentions this to show how their baptism now saves them and makes them different from the world. Although the Christians, you know, maybe they're outnumbered, even as Noah and his family were just a few, they alone find salvation. This is, this is very encouraging. In verse 21, there is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, not, through, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So St. Peter saying, you know, not that baptism saves automatically. No, baptism indeed saves, but not because of the physical act of the removal of filth from the flesh alone. But the baptismal bath alone is not what saves, but rather baptism saves because that bath is also an appeal to God for a good conscience. And it's the significance of the bath that brings regeneration and salvation. Baptism itself in the church's appeal and request to God that the candidate be cleansed from his conscience, receiving the remission of sins. And so bap baptism saves through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because in baptism, the power of the risen Christ enters the life of the one who's baptized. And St. Peter mentions the spiritual dimension of baptism to encourage his hearers to continue to walk in the newness of life, maintaining their good conscience of blameless life among the, among the pagans. And in verse 22, uh, he says, Who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. As an encouragement to those who are suffering, St. Peter concludes this part by saying that Christ himself is now at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven, and the angels and the authorities and powers having been submitted to him. The pagans may think that the Christians are powerless, and they're this minority with no one to advocate for their cause. It's not the case. The Lord of the Christians, Jesus Christ himself, now rules the cosmos from the right hand of God, having transcended this world and gone into heaven itself. All the spiritual powers of this age, the exalted angels, the authorities, the powers, have been submitted to him by the power of his Father. Christ rules over the, the unseen world, which the pagans you know, really think that controls the destinies of men. And so the Christians can persevere in their faith, confident that their Lord will vindicate them at the end. So this concludes chapter three. And I, I think for the sake of time, we'll go ahead and start chapter four. Chapter four is, um, is when St. Peter is really talking about the issue of suffering, right? And forsaking lust and judgment and the glory of suffering. And so let's, let's see how far we can go from here. As we start in verse 1 and verse 2. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. St. Clement of Alexandria said, The cross of our Lord became a fort a refuge against our former sins. And so therefore, since we are renewed, let us be steadfast in the cross in truth and restore our sanctification. So St. Peter continues his exhortation about suffering by urging his hearers to imitate their Lord. If they would be exalted as he was, right? Christ has suffered in the flesh and they must arm themselves also with the same insight, 
And so what is this insight? What is this point of view? What is this attitude? It's the, it's, it's that the life in the flesh in this world must inevitably be sacrificed in suffering if one is to do the will of God. You can't escape suffering. Christ was willing to give up his life to do the will of the Father. And if St. Peter hears, if we hear this, if we had this attitude, it would serve as their armor against the struggle in this world. That is because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And so the thought here is that the Christian suffering sanctifies one's life, separating it from the, the worldliness that's around. And so the connecting concept is that of the flesh. Christ suffered in the flesh. And if we suffer in the flesh, the rest of our time in the flesh will no longer be lived for the desires of man, but for the will of God. And so the flesh, meaning, you know, not so much the, the physical body, but rather our lives in the world. So the flesh, having been touched by the, by the sufferings, it's been changed. And so suffering, persecution, forces us out of the sinful social networks of the Gentiles so that we run with them no longer, right? And so the concept of sin here is not an internal one, but a social one. So St. Peter is not saying that if we suffer persecution, then sinning becomes psychologically and spiritually impossible for us. No, we can still be lazy and still be gluttonous, for example, but the sin St. Peter has in mind is the life given over to the lusts and the desires of men, the plans and the intentions of the Gentiles, the whole social network and a way of life consumed by pleasure seeking. Um, in, in fact, the sin referred to is here in verses two through four, and we'll see that uh, more clearly. So when we are persecuted, we are out of that network once and for all. Verses three, four, and five. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness and lusts and drunkenness and revelries and drinking parties and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. This is a very powerful passage. St. Peter ironically says that, you know, the time has gone, the time that's gone by is sufficient for such sin anyway. You know, his pagan hearers have spent most of their lives already in these kind of sins. And that should be enough. Like enough is enough. And so he lists all the things they have worked out in their lives. And now they should leave alone. Sensualities, desires, um, you know, uh, drinking parties, um, and uh, idolatries and these kind of things. The picture, I guess, is, is one of like many late nights, right? Um, of just wild parties and things like that. And that used to be their life. And their old, um, and their old people, their old network that they used to be with, um, the same ones that now blaspheme and, and make fun of them, mock them. They think it's strange that they don't run with them in this kind of, uh, this kind of dissipation, this kind of flood of sin, you know, this excess. And, and their Christian faith has made them so narrow in, in people's eyes. What happened? They used to be fun. Now look at them. Now look at them in this Christ that they follow, right? And it, it, they look so close-minded. I mean, it's something that we can relate to us today. St. Peter exhorts his hearers to, to not to fear this kind of slander. Um, because those who speak like this will render a word to him who is even now prepared to judge the living and the dead. So what will these pagans answer when they have to give an account for their sinful lives to the God of the Christians? It's a scary thought. It's a, it's a sobering thought. In verse 6, For this reason the gospel was preached also to those who were dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. And so St. Peter drives this point home by saying that the good news for this purpose has been brought even to those who are dead, 
when Christ descended to the land of the dead after his own death, after, as he went to Hades, he proclaimed the gospel to them all so that all who had pleased God by their righteousness, their, their righteous lives, might go with him to the Father. And so all are dead. They are indeed judged like men in the flesh. The righteous among them may live like God in the spirit. All are judged like men in the flesh, and that all receive the sentence of death passed on all men in this life. But the intent of the gospel is, the, is life, that those who die physically may one day be raised and live like God eternally in the realm of the spirit in the age to come. And those of the dead who have lived righteously find the proclamation that Christ has triumphed is good news brought to them because they are to be rescued from the sentence of death and one day rise to live eternally with Christ. And the thought here is not of the dead being given a, a chance to respond to the gospel and to choose whether or not they're going to accept it. Rather, the thought is that those already saved by their God-oriented lives, welcoming the good news that rescue is at hand. And so St. Peter mentions this as it underscores uh, Christ's lordship over both the living and the dead. The Christian God is not um, some, you know, closed off uh, deity. He is the Lord over all men, both the dead and the living, and all will one day give an account to him. There is salvation in no one else. And in verse 7, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. You know, it might seem that the time, like the time of judgment will never come. But St. Peter insists that the end of all things is close. It's near. They have to therefore be restrained and be sober and be watchful in their prayers. You know, the words uh, that are being used here for restrained and sober um, they, they are close, they're closely aligned. To be restrained means to be rational, to be of sound mind, to be sensible. And so persecution or the thought of, of, an, of a, a close end should cause them to lose their minds. No, they have to, keep, they have to be sober, uh, meaning that it's not just that they um, shouldn't be drunk. That's not what this is, but that they must uh, maintain an inner peace, uh, a balance, Right, And this inner balance is for the purpose of persevering uh, in their daily prayers, because these prayers are an anchor during these times of stress and challenges as the end approaches. Um, there is no other refuge but prayer. And in, in the very trying times, there is no other anchor in Christ besides prayers. And um, in other New Testament references, uh, like in James chapter 5, verse 9, and things like this, the sense of, of, the, of the nearness of the end is not a matter of, of a timeline closeness, but of, like the, of the holistic uh, closeness. So St. Peter is not predicting that the end will come in a few months or years. He is saying that the end is the next thing on the divine agenda, so that Christians of every age should live in this state of readiness because we don't know. We don't know when that time will come. In verse eight, and above all things have fervent love for one another for love will cover a multitude of sins. This is one of the most famous, uh, famous verses that we can read. Given this before all things and of the greatness and uh, the great importance, um, they must have fervent love for one another, living as a community of love in Christ. The hardness of this world might tempt one to become uh, cold, right? To grow cold. But love is an action. It's not a feeling. And believers must take care and continue to care for one another. As an incentive, they should remember that this love covers a multitude of their own sins as they forgive one another. God will forgive them. This is mentioned in Matthew chapter 6, uh, right? Verses 14 and 15. In verse 9, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. So one way of exhibiting this fervent love is in being hospitable, 
to one another without, without grumbling, without, without murmuring, right? So the Christians in that day were dependent on mutual, mutual hospitality um, whenever they traveled. And a time when, you know, inns were questionable and expensive, most believers uh, chose to stay with other believers. Some would take advantage of this, causing grumbling and complaining. But such abuses of hospitality uh, shouldn't cause them to close their doors. They must maintain hospitality to Christian strangers without, without murmuring. And I think here's a good place to end in verse 10. <clears throat> uh, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. It's in their eternal life as Christians, each must show love by exercising the spiritual gift that was given to them in such a way as to glorify God. St. Peter presupposes that receiving the spirit in baptism, each baptized believer receives a spiritual gift, some function and, um, so, and calling, some kind, of, uh, some kind of calling in the body of Christ. And it might be dramatic or, or humble, um, such as, you know, um, giving to the poor, for example, but whatever the gift is, they are to use it in serving one another for the common good. And the gifts, they have to remember, it, don't belong to them. This is why even the idea of tithing in the church, it's the money doesn't belong to us, it belongs to God, right? And so these gifts belong to God, these spiritual gifts uh, belong to God. And they are and we are stewards. We are simply administering them as good stewards of the varied grace of God. Um, and so God's grace is varied as the spectrum is varied. Um, and he gives different gifts to each one according to his will. And I think we'll stop there for today. And glory be to God forever. Amen. And we'll continue on with verse uh, 11 um, next time. <clears throat>